Let's bow our heads to pray. Father, I thank you, O Lord, for the opportunity again to preach your word. Thank you, O Lord, for bringing us here. Um, I pray, O Lord, everyone on the sound of my voice that you speak to us, O Lord. Speak to our hearts. Let your word be powerful in our hearts and our minds. And let us not just be hearers, but also doers. Thank you for all the mothers in the house. Empower uh, the mothers in the house and strengthen them, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right. Um, I'm going to focus on verse 7 here. Verse 7. Actually, I'd like to use my Bible. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. The Bible says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So my sermon topic today is the strength of women. The strength of women. So when the Bible says weaker vessel, it doesn't mean weakling. Amen. There's a difference between weaker vessel and weakling. Unless you think men are very weak. So the next thing weaker than men are just weaklings. No. Uh, a weakling is being physically weak and frail. There are many women that are not weak and frail. Bible just said weaker vessel. So let's not look down on women as, oh, these people are weaklings. Or women, don't look at yourself and say, oh yeah, we're, we're weaklings. We can't do all this. No. I'm talking about the strength of women. Women have strength. It's just like seeing a female lion and saying, oh yeah, the female lion is a weaker vessel to the male lion, so therefore the female lion is a weakling. Who would like to meet a female lion in the wild? <laughs> Alright, that's a weakling, right? No, that's not a weakling. Better yet, a bear robbed of her, of her whelps, right? Of her corpse. Who would like to meet that? Uh, our, but the Bible says it's better to meet a fool than to meet that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, back to my sermon. So, an example of a strength that women possess is the strength to give birth. Open to Isaiah chapter 37. Isaiah chapter 37. It takes strength to give birth. So, don't look at women and say, oh, yeah, you guys are weak, or women are weaklings, or oh, they're just weak adverse. So, they are strong. I'm talking about the strength of women. So, and giving birth in the Bible many times, many places, is likened to the great tribulation, right? The tribulation we go through before the day of the Lord can come at any time the travail you know the pangs of a woman so that's what the Bible talks about so uh, it, it's, it takes strength and it takes it, God will give us strength those that know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploits right it's talking about the end times on uh, uh, those last days in Isaiah chapter 37 verse 3 the Bible says and this is the story here is that Hezekiah um, after Rabshakeh you know gave his speech uh, they called for Isaiah and you know just because pick it up just verse 3 I'm reading it says and they said unto him thus said Hezekiah this day is the day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy for the children are come to the birth and there is not strength to bring forth it tells you that it need, you, the, a woman needs strength to bring forth and they are likening it to the kind of situation they were in I mean if you remember the story they were besieged by the Syrian army and it was going to be a tough time it was going to be a bad time and um it's just trouble coming and there's no strength to bring forth that's what they likened it to because it takes strength uh, to to give bring forth children in hebrews chapter 11 verse 11 uh, you know i've opened it i just read it hebrews 11 11 bible says through faith also sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised so it also takes strength to conceive seed that's what the bible says so women are strong don't look at them as weaklings weaker vessels is different from a weakling. Each time they come to, to give birth, you know, uh, they are facing fear and they are conquering fear. This is just an example of women's strength, you know, giving birth. They are facing fear every time and they are conquering it. Uh, it, it takes courage. And courage is a quality of mind that... Uh, that you can face danger without fear. Now, some people say courage is, you know, the absence of fear. When you understand that something is more important than another thing. So, although you have fear, you still, you know, do that thing. And that's what some people say. I'll go with the regular definition. I mean, it's, it's still fine. It sounds good. You know, courage is the absence of fear. But, you know, perfect love driving out all fear, right? So, you still have the fear of God in you. Or you can still do things and you might be a little bit afraid. And you pray, God, please, you know, increase my faith, right? Like the guy prayed. But um, no, without fear, you know, facing something.
women and that, that is courage and women have that after the first child you decide oh, I'm gonna have the second child Wow <laughs> you know God knew okay this is me kidding though but God knew that uh, men will not give birth to two children so he's like Let's, let's, let's give it to the women. You know, they don't know. They don't think rationally. They're just too emotional. You know, baby fever. So I just give it to the women to, to give birth. Because every man, uh, at least me, myself, after the first child, that's it. You know, I, you know trick me once or something. Deceive me once. And shame to me. Uh, trick me in second time. Sorry, deceive me once. Shame to you. Trick me second time. <laughs> shame on me. So I'm not going to fall for it the second time. But, 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 you know, this is me talking. I'm just joking, guys. Um, but women you know they go through this every time so women are very strong you know when you look at it that way so these strengths of women also show the potential strengths of men right i'm preaching about women men don't just say oh yeah tune off and it's not about me but uh think about it if women have this kind of strength how much more men because bible says they are the weaker vessel Amen. They are the weaker vessels. But look at the strengths that women have. Uh, you know, the giving birth part. He said, but it's not for man to give birth, right? So uh, uh, women are created for that role. And God has created us for different roles. So a man cannot be compared to that and say, oh, but women are stronger than men in that they can give birth and men cannot. No. That was the role they were created for. So let's look at the roles. Don't compare apples with oranges. Amen. Amen. So this man is this message is also for men. Uh, everybody hearing the word of God encourages you. Hearing the word of God, hearing preaching. I'm going to preaching from the Bible. I know it's Mother's Day. I'm going to preach from the Bible. So men, everyone, let's tune in. Children, everyone tune in. Amen. Um, for some time now, men are becoming like women. <laughs> so uh, it, it's just crazy. Open to First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine. First Corinthians six, verse nine, and that is men becoming effeminate. That is becoming woman-like. It's a gateway to sodomy. It's a gateway to yeah, you know, being reprobate, being rejected of the Lord. Uh, so, because sodomy is the evidence of it. A man, you know, having uh, flaming uh, desires for another man. That is just. You know, flat out sodomy. In First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine, uh, talking about listing things that uh, of listing attributes or listing characters of people, things that people do that will not inherit the kingdom of God. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of them with mankind. You know, on and on. These will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible says. So this is not talking about work salvation. It's just like God said, you know, in Revelation, that no, anybody that walks, walkers of evil, dogs will not be allowed. He's not saying it's just by their works. He's just saying, going to heaven, this is the standard, right? So if you know this is the standard, like, of what to be in heaven, what you're shooting forward to, then why don't we try to live that life here? Walk in the spirit. Amen. So don't do all these things because the people that do all these things don't go to don't go to heaven. You're not going to see all these things in heaven. So why don't you start acting like, you know, you're a citizen of heaven? That's what Bible is trying to say here. All right. Let's look at five women. My focus. I'm going to focus on five women today to look at their strengths. My five focus women for today. Number one is Deborah. Deborah. And Deborah shows us the strength to play your role as a woman. The strength to play your role as a woman. It takes strength to submit. It takes strength. I mean, how about submitting to a boss, man? <laughs> right? You have your, your boss that is, yeah, that's your boss. Let's put it that way. And you have to submit to him or his, in his characters. You have to submit to it. Uh, you know he's wrong, but you're like, you know, if we can just... <laughs> You don't talk to a king anyhow, right? It takes strength to submit, right? So you have to approach the king. Even though you're right, you still have to counsel the king. And Ahithophel, didn't he hang himself because the king did not listen to his counsel? <laughs> he hung himself. So um, our wives are to submit to their own husbands. So understand your role as a woman. Open to Titus chapter 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 14, the Bible says, uh, open Titus 2, I'll read you 1 Timothy 5, 14. The Bible says, I would therefore that younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So younger women get married, bear children, guide the house, 
so that the, the, the enemy, the adversary, will not speak reproachfully against the church, against the Lord, and blaspheme because of your sake. Remember what David did, and Nathan came to him and told him, because of what you did, the enemies of the Lord are reproaching the Lord, are blaspheming the Lord, because of what you did. So women, if you play your role, then the enemies of the Lord will not blaspheme the Lord. They will not speak re repro reproachfully. Amen? So, uh, we're talking about the strength to play your role as a woman. In Titus chapter 2, verse 3 and 3 to 5, Bible says, the age women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You see that? So, it's the strength to play your role as a woman is something Deborah showed. So, do what God commands before you start adding to it. You know, but I can do more. I can do this. I can, I can help to do that. How about you just do what God commands first? Then you can add to it if you like. To. And I said add to it. I didn't say change it. Because that's things, what people do, especially in churches. You know, they replace evangelism, they replace soul winning for something else, for another ministry. You're replacing it. That ministry is not sin on its own, but when you're not doing what God commands, then it is sin. <laughs> because here's the whole duty of man. Fear God will keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man, right? So, before you add to it, uh, uh, do what God commands. And the misunderstanding there is in Proverbs chapter 31. Oh, she, she went out and she walked and she, you know, brought, you know, went to the merchant ships and all of that. Oh, that means God said I should get a job outside the house. That, you know, because they want to do that. But they will not keep the house first. They want to walk outside the house <laughs> first. So how about you do what God said first? So Deborah was humble enough to know that her ruling is not going to bring peace. Her ruling is not the best for Israel at the time. Uh, not just at the time. It's not the best for Israel, period. And, uh, and she did not hide uh, behind the fact that she was a prophetess. You know, oh, but I'm a prophetess. God is speaking through me, so I should rule. There's nobody else God is speaking through. There's nobody else that, you know, has wisdom of God like me. So, I, I just have to maintain and continue ruling and all of that. You know, I'm talking about people like Joyce Myers, all the female preachers, right? I'm not even saying God is speaking through them, right? Because we have the word of God. So, God's not even speaking through them. But, they're like, oh yeah, I'm a prophetess. Sorry, I'm a pastor. Why are there pastresses and... Um, Dickinesses and all of that because it's, there's nothing like a woman pastor like it doesn't even, it's not English it doesn't make sense it's just like saying a woman Hebrew no she's a Hebrewess right a Jewess that's what the Bible says <laughs> it's, not, it's not everywhere in the Bible yeah because women are not written everywhere in the Bible have you noticed there's no book written by the women no book in the Bible oh by Ruth oh, Ruth was written by a guy he was written by a guy <laughs> I mean that's what it is so understand the role, your role, and, and Deborah understood her role. In fact, open to Judges chapter 4. Deborah understood her role, and, uh, and she submitted. She submitted to a guy called Barak. Barak. When I say Barak, Obama. <laughs> to a guy called Barak. Right? So uh, women preaching behind the pulpit, that is not for you. That is not your role. And you have to submit. And it takes strength to do that. Take strength to do that. If I look at it this way, you are the one training the guys that are going to preach behind pulpits. How about that? Right? Primary education is more important than secondary education. Or actually, elementary education is more, elementary, primary, same thing. Elementary education is more important than secondary ed education. And um, secondary education is more important than what? Uh, college education, right? right? Before PhDs and all of that. So, the primary education is the most important thing. And if you have that wrong, what happens? The future is bleak. <laughs> so, there you go. You're doing a very important uh, a job. So, she was not selfish also. She was not selfish. And I bet she was highly regarded in Israel. The Bible says all Israel came to her for judging, right? For judgment. She judged all Israel. But the point is, Israel will not fare better uh, under her. Israel will fare better under Barak's leadership. Uh, mothers, you will, uh, your home will fare better under your husband's rule. But he, he, he's like Barak. Yes, but it will fare better. That's what God said. Uh, the Bible says so. And she knew that God will punish her. 
She knew. That's why she went to push Barak. <laughs> if, if it was that, oh God, I already told him. He's not doing anything. Right? Let's open our Bibles. Judges chapter 4, I start from verse 1. The Bible says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. So, the Bible says in, in, in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 1, or chapter 3, Jesus, I can't remember which one. But it says that women would rule when you're in sin. You know, children will be your oppressors and women will rule over you. So they were in sin. They did evil. And who was ruling? There was no man to be found. You know, the women, uh, uh, what's her name? Deborah was judging Israel at the time. Verse 2, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, uh, Sisera which dwelt in Harosheth, Harosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried, out on, cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 ch chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Labidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt on a palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, excuse me, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Had not the Lord God of Israel commanded, so this is a past thing. That means she had told him before. She, that has been prophesied before. Barak, you are the leader. God has commanded you to go now, you know, and do all this that I'm going to read. So I found the Lord commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun, and I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitudes, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall be for thine, shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So obviously we know the woman was Jael. We're going to stop here. You see, she was pushing him. She was pressuring him for her to submit to him. Him. Because who was the judge of Israel after the battle? It was Barak. Barak began, ju began judging Israel. I mean, it was even quoted in Hebrews where it says, Oh, no, stop me. It mentioned Barak. <laughs> of all people, mentioned Barak in Hebrews, talking about the men of faith, right? Um, so, so she submitted to Barak because that is what God said. That is the role of women, right? And that is strength. It, it took her strength to submit herself. All oh, Israel is coming to me. Men are coming to me. Men are listening. Barak is listening to me. Barak cannot go to war without me. I am so great. You know, she said, a woman will take your glory. And if it's interesting, God did not make it hard to take the glory. Deborah found another woman, Jael, another wife of a man, <laughs> Heba, right? Another wife. And Jael, a, a woman, uh, the Bible says, you know, was like Mary, blessed amongst, all, uh, amongst women. All right, let's move on. Second woman, our second focus is Abigail. We're looking at the strength to build your house. The strength to build your house. Open to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. So we're looking at the strength of women. It's strength to submit, strength to build your house. Women are very strong. And um, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. So many women make excuses or give reasons such as, Oh, I'm smarter than my husband. Uh, my husband is a fool. Uh, but my husband is reprobate. You know, your husband is reprobate. Why did you marry him? Um, you made vows. Didn't you make vows? Uh, but, but I was unsaved. I was blinded by lust. I was unsaved when I married him. So that, that's why I married him. Uh, but since you made vows, you just follow your vows. Keep your vows. Now that you're saved, you know that you're not supposed to break vows. What is marriage to you? Oh, but I didn't make those kind of vows. You know, they've changed the vows these days. I don't know if you guys know. What I mean, they've changed. I'm talking about unsafe people. And um, they say it's not for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. It's like uh, for better, for better. Right? It, help me out, sorry. Do, it's for better, for better. In, for better, for best. For better, for best, sorry. For better, for best. <laughs> it's sort of in health, in riches. In, like, 
There's no negative. <laughs> because they believed in a Joel Austin style, you know, claim it, say it, believe it, and it, it will come to you. So they don't proclaim any negative things. They don't read any negative part of the Bible. Everything is just positive. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 28, they stop at verse 14, right there. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, wait, there are other verses? Yeah, there are other verses. It goes up to like 50-something. <laughs> Just keep reading. Oh, no, no, no. That part of the Bible doesn't exist, right? This is the kind of people I'm talking about. The Psalm 23 people, you know. Um, so, yeah, they change the vows. They say, oh, I didn't make that vow. Then let me ask you, she a wife? What does wife mean? What does wife mean? <laughs> Amen? So don't think you're smart. Now that you're saved, don't think you're smarter than God. It, no matter how you want to twist it, it's a wife. When they said Deborah, the wife of Labidoth, what do you think that meant? That she was the master of Labidoth? No, that she was submitting to Labidoth. That's why I said the wife of Labidoth. Jael, the wife of Herber, that means she was submitting to her. Herber went to battle and Sisera uh, came and she took him inside the house and killed him, right? So, uh, so don't make excuses. Abigail was one woman that had all the excuses. Had everything, right? Uh, but she didn't use any of them. Oh, my husband is stupid, he's a fool. No, she didn't use that to bring down her house. Instead, she built her house. And it took strength for her to do it. Knowing that you're married to a son of Belial. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, he's a rabbit. But, no, no, no. Build your house. Don't pluck down your house. So she helped her husband to keep his house and his head. I mean, that's, that's her opportunity to, yeah, just kill him. Just, he, he's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a bad guy. I mean, you're doing God a favor. Don't, it's not you that said, don't I hate them that hate thee, O Lord? <laughs> I mean, she could have said that. But she built her house because she didn't think, oh, I'm smarter than God. You know, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. she submitted, right? And she built her house. Let, let's, let's pick up the story from verse 13. We know the story very well. I mean, David has been helping this man and his people, and the man was throwing a feast, and David wanted some things, and the guy just, you know, talked down on David. So in verse 13, 1 Samuel 25, And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword, and, and they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men, and 200 abode by the stove, but one of the young men told Abigail. It's very interesting. The young man did not come and warn the son of Belial, Nabal. But he came to warn the wife. What does that tell you? It tells me that she's been doing this. This is not the first time. It's not her first rodeo. <laughs> right? She's been saving this guy. She's been saving the house. So they are like, so who has been saving us? You run straight to that. <laughs> so I wrote to, to Abigail, um, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and they were not, and we were not hot, neither missed we anything, as long as they were conversant, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the field. They were wall unto us both by night and by and day, and all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do. We're talking to Abigail here. Wisdom. I mean, I could also use wisdom, but building your house, it takes wisdom to build your house. I'm not talking about physically building your house. Amen? I mean, that's a man's job. You are supposed to provide shelter, provide for your own, right? I'm talking about building your house, you know, with wisdom, building a house, which, uh, you know, what you're doing, keeping the house. That's what I'm talking about. So they came to her and said, hey, you got to build this house here because the house is about to be destroyed. They're going to kill everything, kill everybody, all the men. So he, the guy knew that because he knows how a man will think. He knows David is coming to destroy everybody. It says, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. And that is a picture of the world we're living in. Right? We Christians, we are here to preserve the earth. We are the salt of the earth. You know, we're preserving the earth. Evil is determined to this world. We're just preserving it, holding on until, you know, God's judgment comes in. Yeah? Because the master, <laughs> the God of this world is the devil. Right? So, uh, but we're here living in this world. So because of that, you know, God is just saving the house. Just like Abigail has been saving, you know, the household. And it's not a perfect analogy, but... That's just what I want to think of. Now look at the weapons of Abigail, verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves 
those are uh, shields, uh, sorry, spears, and two bottles of wine, those are the explosions, explosives, and five sheep ready dressed, those are the horses, right? And five measures of parched corn, I I'm just, I'm just, but I'm saying this is how <laughs> she's going to stop David, right? That is woman's strength. Now, if she was not a virtuous woman of some sort, I don't know if she was a perfect virtuous woman, but if she was not a virtuous woman, would she have all these things in her house? No, she wouldn't. Five measures of parched corn and a and, and hundred clusters of raisins and two hundred cakes of figs and lay them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, neighbor. Pause there. All the OTLs, can, they, 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 they can't have, what are OTLs? OTLs are obey the law. Obey the law. The law says, you know, it's coronavirus. Nobody should shake each other. Don't, don't even come six feet. You know, OTLs. Six feet. No, yes, yes, yes. Obey the law to the dot. That's all the OTLs cannot leave here. Like, see, she's wrong. Why didn't she tell her husband? The husband is the head. You gotta tell him everything. If you're going to do something to save him, you still have to tell him. <laughs> right? The OTLs would just, you know, go crazy here. Remember, the husband was drunk. Husband was not, it was crazy. <laughs> and on top of that, he's a son of Belial. But he was drunk, in a drunken state. Do you think he's reasoning? Now, Bible says we should walk in the spirit. The letter kill it, right? Uh, the, uh, the spirit giveth life. That words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So we should walk in the spirit. Jesus, even uh, David, right? He ate of the bread, uh, of the showbread. David ate of, ate of the showbread. If he was an OTL, oh no, but then he would have died. <laughs> Jesus too, on the Sabbath day, they were telling him, oh, why are you, why are you eating? Why are you doing all this? Didn't you see what David did? All the OTLs are the Pharisees, hypocrites. You know? Oh, oh but your know, speed limit is 60, so you can't do 61. Really? <laughs> I mean, what if your wife is pregnant and you're rushing to the hospital? Oh no, OTL, 60. Just maintain 60. <laughs> If, uh, I don't want to go off on OTLs, but let's move on. Especially this coronavirus. OTL will be reporting a man and his kid playing outside in only them in the whole park. <laughs> <laughs> that they <are> trans. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how that works. I mean, and, and the government, government, some governors are like, oh yeah, call, call, you know, talk, it's a snitch on your neighbors that they are having a party in their, in their backyard. Like, it doesn't even make sense. All right, let's move on. OTLs, guys. Verse 20. And it was so, as she rode on the house, that she came down by the, by, by the covert on the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow had in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him. And he had requited me evil for good. So and, mo so and more also do God, do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave all that pertained to him by the morning light, any that pissed against the wall. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her feet, and bowed herself to the ground, and fell at his feet, and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience, and hear the words of thine handmaid. So she's taking the guilt of her husband. It's like, oh, that guy is crazy. She was not pushing the blame. Remember, this is her house. You have to look at it as one house. Amen? Second guilt of her husband there. Um, verse, where was I? Verse 25. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and fall is with him. But, uh, but I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord had withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as neighbor. So, <laughs> this woman, I like how she's talking to David. She's entreating him. This is the definition of entreating. <laughs> right? In fact, we'll keep reading. I'll show you exactly what entreating is called. How you talk to authority. Right? She completely submitted herself. And even in this verse, she's already speaking of, she, she believes that David has been stopped. At this point, I mean, was David coming there in, with the intent of not killing everybody, every man? I mean, he was going to destroy that household. But when she reached him, she's like, oh yeah, you know, seeing that the Lord 
So it's God that is doing it that's, that withheld David from coming to shed blood. David is coming to shed blood. But she said, oh, the Lord had withheld you, has withholding you from coming to shed blood. So she's already speaking positively. She believes that it's going to happen. That's how you have to take it as, uh, you know, building your house with wisdom when you're praying to God or when you're asking for something. Okay, verse 27. And now this blessing which thine handmaid had brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. That's why it's too much for David. You know, you just, you know, just give it to the young man. Just, you know, let them have fun. Because you, David, you're just you know, a wonderful guy. Now, I don't think she was flattering him. I mean, I think she was doing what, what she had to do to save herself. But it goes about uh, having a gift. A gift will make way for you, right? So, but let's not digress so much. Just talking about her building a house. Verse 28. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of Nabal. No, of thine handmaid. She had already taken the guilt upon her. So David is going to shift his focus from, oh, it's no more Nabal. It is now the handmaid. It is now Abigail. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighted the battles of the Lord, and evil had not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is reason to pursue thee. She's talking about King Saul. So you see, this woman has wisdom. She... she she watches CNN. No, not CNN. She, she knows stuff, right? <laughs> she has wisdom. She knows that David... In fact, everyone knew Saul was pushing David. So let's not give her too much credit on that one. Everyone knew Saul was pushing David. And no one wants to mention Saul. Right? Because he's the king. Because you have to be careful with the king also. Because the king can have your head. So she, you can see all the wisdom that's just coming out of this woman by the words that are coming out of her mouth. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in a bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thy enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to... What does she know? I, I, I want to... I want, this woman is very smart. <laughs> you see why David is just like... As soon as Nabal dies, like, that's my wife. <laughs> You know, like this woman is very. Why did she use sling? Everyone knows how David killed Goliath. Everyone knows that. So she's just using words and her gifts and everything just to cool David down. You know, a calm answer, a gentle answer, right? Drives away wrath or anger, quenches anger, something like that. Bible says, uh, I say Bible. Let's keep going. Verse 30, I'll soon be done here. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he had spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. So she has already asked, oh yeah, this is going to happen. Look at verse 31. This is entreating. That there shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord. Either that thou hast shed blood costlessly, uh, costless, or that my Lord had avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. So she has already gone to the fact that, oh, when you become king, don't let the fact that you killed people be a grief unto you. You know, David has no evil. He hasn't done evil, right? I mean, what she's saying. Like, he ha you've done no evil. You've done no wrong. You've been fighting God's battles. You've been killing the Philistines. You've been serving your king, right? But your king is trying to kill you. Don't worry. God bless you. you you become a king. Now, when you are king, the fact that you killed Nabal's household, that will be a stain on your record. It will be a grief of mind to you. So, don't let this thing be a grief of mind to you. And when you become king... Don't even, you know, come and kill us again. <laughs> you know, just remember me. Just remember your handmaid and just, you know, show favor unto us. That's, that's what she was saying. So that's how to build your house, women. It's not, oh, build your house and you go out there, go work, go do this. Oh, but I'm building my house. I'm making sure that, you know, we're being provided for. I'm making sure that this, my husband, he's not, you know, he's stupid. He doesn't know. So I'm trying to make sure I, I hold this house. You know, I'm the glue that holds the house together. You know, that's what you're saying. No. It is by you submitting to your husband. <laughs> right? And making sure your house stands and your husband keeps his head. Your husband keeps, he's not ashamed, he's not disgraced, he's not destroyed because he's the head of the house, right? So that is building your house. Let's move on. Number three, number three, I'm going to be faster. I don't have much. Those are two long stories. The number three woman here is Lamwell's mother. Lamwell's mother. And this is, I'm talking about the strength to train your child. The strength to train your child. It is not an easy feat to train children. And 
and I'm not just talking about the academics, and I know the academics is a problem to many people, because I know somebody told me that, oh, I'm not qualified to train my child, right? As <laughs> someone said, um, I don't know what qualifications they are looking for, but uh, it's not just the academics, but the life, training your child for life, their beliefs, their foundational beliefs that they're going to build upon, right? Jesus is our foundation is the foundation no other foundation can any man lay but than that which is laid right so Jesus is the foundation and we're supposed to build upon that now if the foundation is bad what's going to happen everything we build will be crumbled so you are you are laying down that foundation and it's not just academics it's not just math and it, it is everything about life right their beliefs how they see things how they perceive the world what they know about the world especially spiritual life so that's something you want to especially put in them you want to you want to get them saved as soon as possible and you want to grow their beliefs on the word of God right laying up precept upon precept so that's what that's training your child it's not just taking them uh, doing academics uh, developing a child's mind each child is different too it's not just copy and paste all right I have the first child copy and paste <laughs> right it doesn't work that way <laughs> and everyone will know that you know the hard way if you don't learn it now that's not copy and paste you have to approach each child differently the questions they ask how fast they go so a person's brain is not fully developed until 25 years old Go, go research that. It's not fully developed until 25 years old. So don't think, oh, yeah, um, they're still learning. That's my point. Like, when they leave your house, they're still learning. So if you've not done it right now, it's going to be bad. Because they'll, they'll build and learn and solidify that foundation at 25, and their lives are going to be ruined from there. So, um, so your lifestyle also must be exemplary. When you're training a child, you too, because they, they are not only, in fact, they are more likely to do what they see you do than to do what you tell them to do. So training a child, <laughs> you are the portrait. You are the example. So it's very difficult that way. Your lifestyle, everything. And we're looking at Lemuel here and the strength to train your child. That's what women have. Women have the strength to train your child. Women are strong. They can do that. They can change their lifestyle. They can do the right thing. I mean, a woman, when she gets married, she has a child, things, things change. She has to start training that child. And this coronavirus saga has given many women a taste for it. You know, many women that, you know, escape to walk. <laughs> to walking outside the house. Now they're kind of forced to walk with their children. And there are many memes out there of how they walk with their children. <laughs> <laughs> but it shows you what they think of it. That is difficult. It is hard work. And I believe now people look at homeschooling mothers. Many people look at homeschooling mothers and, and you know, give them kudos. It's hard work you're doing. And, you know, kudos to you. And this, these are women that deserve the double honor, right? That the Bible is talking about. Because they are working hard. So it's, it's, it's an easy thing uh, to, uh, to say, ah. Uh, Let's take our child and train them somewhere else. Like, let's send our child for someone else to train. That is the easy part. Don't think it's the hard part where you go to work, you get some money and pay someone to train your child. That is easy. You train your child is the harder part. And women are doing it, women do it, and that is the strength of women. So look at that, women tra training children. That is the strength of women. It is easier for someone else to train your child. Uh, because for most people, homeschooling, sorry, for most people, they are not homeschooling simply because it is hard work. It's not that <laughs> they don't have the, the resources to homeschool, like one, one income cannot keep the house. One income can keep the house, but they are still not homeschooling because it is hard work. There are women that stay at home, but still send their children to school. Or still daycare or something because they're like how, how do you how do you survive <laughs> I, I need to have peace and sanity and, and stuff in their house so they send their children away when they come back they brace themselves <laughs> for, for children coming back so now understand there are different life situation I'm talking about the ideal situation that women do this and we look at the strength of women there are different life situations that might demand you to homeschool your child for example if something happens to my wife for some reason she cannot homeschool children maybe it's health conditions or something yeah go for a surgery something for years or what's god forbid she dies my children are going i'm not training they have to work right so I'm, I'm saying it happens in different situations i'm just looking at the strength of women and women homeschooling that shows that they are strong and um so most people they'll prefer to go and make a living 
go and work than to homeschool just because it is hard work. And that, that is the excuse. In Proverbs chapter 31 verse 1, talking about Lemuel here, it says, I'll just read one verse, I have to open it. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. You see that? So this is a woman that trained her child. Not just a woman, she was a queen because she was teaching the crown prince, right? So she was a queen. And what did she teach him? She taught him about alcohol, <laughs> right? She taught him about mercy, justice, judgment. She taught him about the qualities of a virtuous woman. See all the things she was teaching this, her, her son because he was a crown prince. He's going, his decisions are going to affect souls. Now, which woman here will say her child's decision is not going to affect souls? And you're deceiving yourself. Your children are kings too. I'm talking to believers. Your children, they get saved. It's up to them. The keys of the kingdom of heaven is in their hands. If they go soul winning, people's souls will be won. People will go to heaven. If they don't, your children can potentially be pastors. Your children can be, will do great and many things. They will affect generations. We're kings and priests. So don't just look at your child and say, oh, it's not a crown prince, so I don't need to train him. No, it's even more important than that. Amen? So let's train all our children. And it, it's, it takes strength to train your children. And women have that strength. Strength of women. All right, let's go to number four. Esther, the strength to be selfless. The strength to be selfless. Open to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're looking at Esther here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I have to go faster. The Bible says in verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of themselves, so of their own selves. So when it says men, it's talking about mankind, right? It's not just men. Women too, right? <laughs> For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous. We're talking about women too. Boasters. Proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I want to focus more on without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, on and on and on. So in these last days, we have many ostrich mothers, and I've preached about it, ostrich mother. Uh, mothers that just leave their children in the sand, leave their eggs in the sand, right? So just drop off your child. You don't care what's going to happen to the child. So these are women without natural affections. Because why? They are lovers of their own selves. Oh, they care about, I need to get, I, I need to get me my nails done and my hair done. Can, can you buy this coronavirus? I can't even get my hair done. You know, like, so, um... They're well aware of all the dangers that happen to the child, but they cannot be selfless, right? Because they are, they are self, selfish. There you go. Lovers of their own selves. Uh, the school bus dangers, public school dangers, daycare dangers, all the forms of it, you know, they, they don't care. But they, they care about their fashion, their body, you know, what, what they call having a life, whatever that means. Oh, I need to have a life, you know. So your life is what God says your life is. You know, in the house, your children, love your children, bear children, keep the house. That is your life. In fact, that is a blessed life. <laughs> Not just your life. That is a blessed life. Um, so, um, so when they love their own selves more than they love their children, more than they love their house, more than they love what God says they should do, that is, uh, that is sinful. That is worship of themselves. And when they love their... And if you don't love your child how God says you love your child, it is still uh, selfishness. Because you say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm giving my child everything they ask for. I spare the rod every time. I don't train them hard. Oh, but I just love my child so much. You know, that's still wrong. That's, that is you trying to get glory. You trying to make them like you. Instead of you instilling the fear of God in them. By them fearing you first. You see that? Um, so you have to care for them how God says you should care for them. So here is Esther. In Esther chapter 4. I'm going to read one verse. In verse 16. Esther chapter 4. You can open there. Esther, she's secured in Shushan the palace. Right? I like how the Bible says Shushan the palace. But she's secured in Shushan the palace. She's loved by her husband. I know he has many other wives. But... She's loved by her husband, right? You know, that's the thing about having multiple wives. You know, when I used to have one, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You notice that there's just one they love, right? There's always one they love. The rest of them are just, I don't know. 
The rest of them are just wives. Like, I don't know, not even wives. I don't know what the rest of them are. But there's one they love. And okay, look at Elkanah, right? The rest of them is just because he needs something. Like he needed children. But he loved Hannah. But Penina was just for children. All right, so uh, that's Esther's situation. The, hus uh, the husband, what's his name again? King Cheese. Anyway, the king loved... Oh, his name is such a popular name. Azarius. There you go. Ahazarus. There you go. King Ahazarus, he loved Esther. Um, how I know he had other women? Because he didn't come to visit Esther for months. <laughs> we're, not, we're not kids now, are we? Right? So, so he loved Esther very well um, because he lifted up the scepter for her. So uh, that tells me he loved her. So I know she was loved by her husband. She was provided for. I mean, she had her own house, her own guards, everything. So she was well secured in Trisha and the palace. She put her life on the line for her people. Do you think Esther would have died? I mean, I know what Mordecai said. Mordecai said, don't think you're safe in that place because God will still, you know, <laughs> hold you responsible. Since he put you in the place to help your people. So God has put women in the position to be selfless for their children, for their family. Right? So you've been put in that place by God. God's going to hold you responsible. That's why I said, um, what's the first person? Deborah. Deborah knew God would punish her if she does not push Barak. Because God has commanded something to Deborah. Tell Barak this. And Barak is not doing it. Deborah said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to just go with you. I'm going to say everything you want because God has said this. So she's fearing God <laughs> more than, you know, she, uh, she wants what is happening. She's just fearing God more than she wants Barak to play the games that Barak is playing. I mean, such a womanly man. But... Uh, so she put her life on the line for her people. She could have died first. And that would have just been first option. Mordecai would be like, ah, oh, I guess that didn't work. All right, so God, please, how are we going to save us? <laughs> you know, that's what anybody would have thought. It's like, if, if many people were Esther, maybe if I was Esther, I'd be like, wait, wait, let's exhaust all options. Stop rushing me. How about we try killing this guy? I mean, have you guys tried that? I'm a queen. I, I can get some guys. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> how about we try other options? No, but she put herself on the line. She's the first option. Don't put God's word second. Don't say, oh, you know, I know somebody has literally, or I've heard this, that it says, I'll send my children to school. I have the ability. I have the, the, the finances, everything. I'm well secured. I, I have the ability to stay home and train my child. In fact, I'm very smart to stay home and train my child. I went to college and everything. I can stay home and train my child. It's not a problem. But I'll first send my children to school. Now, if they learn any bad thing there, if they are corrupt or anything, when they come back, I'll correct them. Someone has said that. <laughs> so, the, the, God's word is not the first option. Do you see what I'm saying? They are not selfless. They are like, oh, let's try other options first before we go back to God's word. But remember, uh, don't, do not be deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. And it's better to stay right, or it's easier to stay right than to get right. Oh, when your child is corrupt, you might not know until it's too late and they've already grown and they found the, the you know, I, I was talking about the foundation, right? The concrete is, is quick, quick crete, right? It's as dried up and it's solid. That's when you now want to do the work with the pickaxe to remove the concrete, the foundation, you know, and there's rebars in there and everything. <laughs> So instead of using that time to build the right foundation, you're using that time to destroy what was built, built already. So my point is she was the first option and she didn't say let's try other options and she submitted her life. Look at verse 16. I'll just read one verse. Esther chapter 4 verse 16. She said, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days uh, three days, night or day, I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go into to go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. What else? Right? It's not according to the law, but I'm going to do it. Do you see that? That's what saved Israel. That was God's plan of saving Israel, not according to the law. Oh, you got to You're doing pastor in sixty-five on the sixty. My wife is pregnant. Okay? That's not the only reason. But <laughs> okay. 
I've never gone that. So which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Are you ready to be selfless like that? That takes strength. That takes strength for a man to lay down his life for his friends. Right? All right, let's go to the last one here. Ruth. Ruth. The strength for a life of hardship. The strength for a life of hardship. And now, all these things, they overlap a little bit. Like I could use Abigail for a strength for a life of hardship. She married, uh, what's his name? Nabal. What, it might seem easy to you. Ah, oh, she's rich. Nabal is rich and everything. It, it's mostly the young men are not married. Like, ah, oh, yeah, she, she's probably having it. No, no, no. It's not just riches. It's not just buy me this and buy me that. You know, it's a relationship, right? It's being married to your husband. You're one with your husband and all of that. So that, that is what women want. So she, do you think she could discuss serious things with Nabal? <laughs> do you think she was having a life of sorts? Like, it was just horrible for her. She was having to keep her house standing. I mean, it was just too much work for her. But she still had to do it. It was a life of hardship. So as I said, all this could overlap. I'm just picking these people. So Ruth, open to Ruth chapter 1. I read from verse 15. Ruth knew when she what uh, Ruth knew what she was doing when she got herself into it. She knew what life she was getting into. Because I believe she was beautiful, right? And she was still young. She could have just gone and married someone else. I hope we all know the story of Ruth, right? Her husband died, and which Israelite shows she's a Moabite, right? So her husband, her fam, her husband's family moved to Moab, and that's where she got married to one of the uh, to one of the Israelites there. And he died. So the mother, Naomi, was going back to Israel, hearing that, you know, the coronavirus is over. Sorry, <laughs> the famine is over. <laughs> so she was moving back. And um, uh, Ruth decided, yes, I'm going to go back with you as a widow. And I'm going to work hard. I mean, she wasn't going to go back and marry another Jew guy or another Israelite. You know, you guys are handsome. No, she was like, I'm going to go back and work hard and be with you and help you. And your God, my God, where you, in fact... I'm going to read that. But, so, Ruth knew what she was getting herself into, and her mother-in-law warned her, told her, you can have a better life. Go and get married. You're still young. You don't even, you're not even coming with baggage, right? You know, another child or something like that. You can have a better life. Uh, yes, life is hard, but it's not even as hard as Ruth had it. But Ruth was submitting herself to it. Right? Even God says, when your husband dies, you know, go and marry someone else. <laughs> right? God not say, oh, yeah, still with that, your mother-in-law, and work for her. Help her. She's old. Can't you see she's old? God says she's going to marry someone else. And when you marry someone else, who do you think you're submitting to? To that man. And he's new and, you know, you're helping his house. <laughs> so how about that mother-in-law that had, you married the son that he died? Just what I'm trying to show you here is, I mean, like the OTL, so just follow the law, go and marry someone else and all that, you know. All that. I'm telling you that Ruth submitted herself to hardship. A young woman in uh, just to go and serve her mother in law. So, when the mother in law dies, now what happened to her own life? Who's there to serve her? So, who, who will take care of me after I finish taking care of you? I don't have any children. I don't have this. I don't. And it was a big deal back, I mean, in those days, even up to now. So, it's, it's a big deal. No child, nobody in old age. Old age. And she was ready for that life. She had submitted herself to that life. And um, so, yes, life is hard, but it's not even as hard as Ruth uh, had it. Uh, or, yeah, had it initially. So, we. The, the one that God has given us. And God, what did God say? My burden is light and my yoke is easy. So how about you submit to what God says? Because his body is light and his yoke is easy. You, uh, say you. Ruth's uh, body, uh, burden, she was picking up a heavy burden here. And don't give it lip service and say, oh yeah, I want to, I want to help. I, I, I would like to do this or do that. That's up, up for her. Right? Of us giving lip service, oh, we'll help you, we'll go with you. Just go back and enjoy your life. Oh, okay, I'll go back. <laughs> All right, let's pick up the story from verse 15. I'll read a few verses so we can, we can be done. Ruth chapter 1, verse 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou, go, for, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. 
I mean, that is determination. That is saying, I'm, I'm ready for this hard life. I'm, I have the strength for this hard life. Oh, but uh, my husband left me and he's all of that and he's all of that. But he's married to somebody else. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to marry someone else too. Is that what God said? That's not what God said. Ruth had the power to marry someone else. But God said, until your husband dies, you cannot marry someone else. You have the strength <laughs> to go through a hard life. You don't like the card that life dealt to you? It happened to Abigail. She married the son of Belial. As smart as Abigail is, I don't think, you know, she was like in love with the guy, I married the guy. I mean, I have my own stories. I think that her father <laughs> liked the money, the dowry, and he's like, oh, marry that guy. That guy that you love is just... He's not his poor, so marry that guy. So it might, it might be a bad card that life dealt her, but she went through her hard life. So follow the word of God. And if you notice, it was because of God. It was because of God. She wanted the God of Israel, not the God of the Moabites. So she probably saw the lifestyle of her husband and everything because she submitted to her husband. She was ready to go with his God and everything. So when you start the right way, it's easier to stay right than to get right, right? I just said that, said that previously. So this is a challenge for you. We have the Bible. We know the will of God. Are you willing to do it? Don't give it lip service like offer or opera. So in conclusion, this message is in no support of the modern feminism movement. Oh, women are strong, stronger than men. I, I, I never said that. Remember, I started off, women are the weaker vessel, but not the weakling. They are not weak and frail. They are strong. Women are strong. In true feminism, I don't know what, because I believe in feminism, not just what the Bible says. You know what the Bible, the Bible says? At the end times, they will say good is bad and bad is good. Right? Good is evil and evil is good. Like, it's so messed up. Lib what does it mean to be liberal in the Bible? <laughs> it's a good thing. But look at liberal. I don't even want to be associated with that word right now. Because of what's going on in the world. So, uh, this message is not supporting modern feminism, which is breaching or destroying the role of women and calling masculinity toxic. That's, that's not what I'm doing in this message. I'm just showing you that women are strong in their God-given roles, in what they can do. And you can see these examples in the Bible, that women have strength. And uh, these were strong women in the Bible. The Bible says in Psalm 68, I have to open there because of time. Psalm 68, verse 11 and 12. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Kings of army did flee apace. And she that tarried at home divided the spoil. Right? So, you play your part. Stay in the role that God has given you. God, he gave the word. Great, are people that published it. You know, armies did flee. That means the men did their work. And they brought in spoil. And she that stayed at home divided the spoil. Amen? So, let the men go off to war. Let them provide. Let them defend. Let the women build, manage, keep the house. You know, the strength to play your, your role. You have that strength. Women have that strength. The strength to build your house. You have that strength. Just say, I can't build my house. This, my husband is horrible. He's always breaking down the house. You still have the strength to build it. Oh, the strength to train your children. You have the strength. I can't do it. No, you can do it. The strength to be selfless. Right? I mean, even animals show that strength. I've said this before. As, as a child, I knew the strength of a mother hen. Right? The mother hen. I used to mess with the, the hens and, you know, throw rocks at them and stuff like that. So this mother hen had chicks. So I went and I picked up one of the chicks, you know, to play with it. And she turned. She, I mean, just one chick. I, took, I mean, she had many. I just wanted one. So she turned. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. She put her feathers down like this. Like, you know, they are normally like that. So she put her feathers down and was running after me. That was the last day I messed with mother hens. That was the last day. I don't mess with them anymore. Even up to now, I mean. <laughs> Even the talkies, like, you know. I don't mess with them anymore because when they, they'll be selfless. What do you think she could have killed me? No. <laughs> She's like, I know I'm going to die and you're going to eat me. I might as well die now. <laughs> Why? Because of her chicks, right? Her, her, her children. <laughs> so, uh, learn to be selfless. If it's instill, uh, even God put that in animals, how about us that are more, that are not beasts? How about that? We're not animals. Uh, and finally, the strength for a life of hardship. 
the strength for a life of hardship. Women are strong. And the Bible talks about the strength of women. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Open our eyes to the strength of women. Thank you for such a wonderful day. It's Mother's Day. We're celebrating mothers in our lives, celebrating mothers everywhere. I uh, thank you, Lord, for the strength you gave women to give birth. Uh, it's not an easy thing, but you put it in them and to give birth and they have the strength to do it. And, you know, woman came from man, but man off woman. So I thank you for that, oh Lord. I pray, Lord, you bless mothers, especially the ones in the house, oh Lord. Bless all the mothers, potential mothers. Help them, oh Lord. Help them to realize the strength that they have and not look at themselves as weak or weaklings. But yeah, weaker vessels, so let them play the role that you've given them, oh Lord, according to your word. And let them find joy in doing that, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you for our church. Thank you for bringing us here after a long time. Pray, Lord, you strengthen us. Uh, no evil will befall us, O oh Lord. Those that couldn't make it, be with them. Help them. Let things clear out so that they can have the opportunity to come out, O oh Lord. And I pray, O oh Lord, things will return to normal. At least the soul winning. Help, help us, O oh Lord, so that we can get back into that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. Next time we meet, let it be to your glory. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen.